Behind the Leaf discusses cannabis in terms of education, history, culture, policy, and advocacy. It is geared for adults only. If you are not an adult, come back when you are. Oh, hey, what's up, guys? I didn't notice this huge camera in the middle of the fridge behind all the concentrate. How are you doing? Welcome to another episode of Behind the Leaf. Today, it's a cold one. <laughs> Today, we have a very special guest interview with Ethan Hebert, who is a suicide attempt survivor along with a mental health advocate. At the root of it, we meet up with Long Beach City College School Board Vice President Uduak Joe Inta to talk about the brand new Introduction to Cannabis Curriculum course. We're gonna meet up with Stephanie, LBCA team member on High History to talk about the Boggs Act and why exactly they put first offense minimums. Last but not least, we're gonna swing by Haven, check out our neighborhood dispensary and LBCA member and find out what makes them unique. Grab your joints, grab your dab rigs, grab all the concentrate and meet me on this episode of Behind the Leaf. Let's go. You know what, I might have a friend come over later. I'll save these, just in case. You never know. Oh, what's up, what's up dude? Come on, Thanks for down. having me over. No worries, yeah. man. This used to be my friend, Tommy. Now he's my best friend. But the thing about him is, he used to take pharmaceuticals. And it wasn't really good for him. He was always in pain, he's an amputee, and he felt he needed something that was a little bit better than what he was given from the doctors. And then he found medicinal dabs and cannabis and edibles that really helped him change his life. Look at the smile on his face. And it's not because a white pill helped him, it's because a green plant did. That's the face of relief, real pain relief. My name is Ethan Hebert. I'm from Long Beach, California, and I enjoy cannabis because the way it makes me feel. I think that's why we all enjoy it. It's an... I am a college student at Cal State Long Beach. I am, I volunteer with NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mental Illness. I am a suicide attempt survivor, which has really defined me in that. I do a lot of advocacy for suicide prevention and I like to help people when I can. 10 days after my 17th birthday, I attempted suicide by way of firearm, which put me in a position where I had 3%, 3% of surviving at all. And of that 3%, only 7% chance of having any quality of life. So after finding all this out and telling people what happened to me, everyone was so uh, inspired, which is their, you know, their words that I felt like I really had to share this story. And every time I share it, it continues to inspire and, and move people. So I, it's, it helps people and it helps me. So I, I love what I do for the mental health community. When I was eight years old was the first time I 
really thought about suicide as a way of escaping my problems. That was the first time it hit. It wasn't, I didn't think about how I would do it. It was just the vague concept of this is something I can do. And for the next nine years, I, I just kind of sat on this idea. It wasn't, I didn't think about it. It was just something I thought about from time to time. And then 10 days after my 17th birthday, I had a mental break at a time where I didn't, I wasn't mature enough to understand that I was in a danger zone of mental health wise or a crisis. I didn't know that about myself because I had been living with it for so long under the idea that this is just how my life was that I had no idea how close to the edge I was. So when I got, when something finally pushed me off, I, I was practically defenseless. I, I knew where to get a firearm or how to get one and I had no, the thought of surviving in any real way never crossed my mind. I never thought on that day anyway that I would do something like that and survive. It was never, my main reason, I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't see it as selfish myself despite hearing my whole life that, you know, suicide is selfish. I thought I was helping my loved ones. I thought I was relieving them of a burden, which is how I saw myself. And what ended up happening was that everyone in my life, family, extended family, family friends, my friends, they all came to the hospital. They all came to support my family and my other loved ones to get through, the, to support me through this challenging period. So now I know that I'm not a burden, which I was like, I thought I was, but that was really what drove me. That was the, what allowed me to be okay with it in my head was this idea that I'm not hurting anybody with my action, even though I hurt a lot of people by what I did. For me, I think at this point, it's mostly about stigma reduction, as in, it seems to me that most people today have heard of mental health and bipolar and depression, and they hear about these terms. So for me, it's more about spreading the education and actual awareness of what these things are. Not just that they exist, but have more, uh, more complete understanding. After a, my attempt with the firearm, I had a, what in the medical industry is called a near-death experience. Full on, light at the end of the tunnel moment. And at the time I had heard of near-death experiences before where people are embraced in warm, positive, glowing lights. And my mom even had had an experience like this where she told me very detail about how it, her near-death experience was a very loving experience. And so I thought that that's what death was gonna be like for me. A loving, kind, warm, welcoming place. The light at the end of the tunnel was very cold and the tunnel was very dark. So I got tremendously scared. For the first time of, of dying at that point, and I, I just began to pray. I didn't, it wasn't to Jesus, it was to no real, I just used the term God. I didn't, there was no name calling. I just prayed for salvation from God and I begged. And the next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. The firearms I had access to at the time were a shotgun and two pistols. I went for the pistols as that's, you know, the iconic, if you're gonna shoot yourself, it's, that's the, it's what comes to mind. In the, in the gun safe that held the handguns, there was two of them, a 45 and a 5.7. The 5.7 is the fastest pistol bullet on the planet. I didn't go for the shotgun or the 45 because I didn't want to make such a grotesque mess. Something about the the big fat 45 bullet or the shotgun, I, while I understood it was for sure going to do the job, seemed a little too graphic. I don't know. I don't know why that was a sticking point for me, but I it saved my life because the four, the 57 bullet traveled so fast, it went directly through my skull. The entrance wound is right here, this kind of indentation next to my right eye. And then the exit wound is a tiny little scar right here because the bullet was so small and fast. 
I would like to prevent as many suicides as I can. And it's, it's not always preventable. Everyone, if you know anyone who's been affected by suicide, it's, uh, it's nobody's fault. It's, it's not a hundred percent. It is preventable, but it is not a hundred percent preventable. And so I would like to be responsible for as many preventions as I possibly can. So on, on a medical level, I suffer from neurospasticity, which means uh, my muscles on my left side are very, very tight because my brain is constantly sending the tightening signals to these muscles and I, I don't have any control over that, so it's kind of left them paralyzed. And it's, it's really uncomfortable and if, you, you know, if you've ever had like a tight muscle, it's like that but all the time and you can't do much to stop it. Cannabis has been one of the things that has tremendously helped reduce the muscle tension and give me more range of motion throughout the day, making it easier to walk around. So that's, I mean, that's like the physiological side of it. On the other, on the mental side, it allows me to manage my anxiety in a more effective way, I suppose, than just riding out panic attacks. Enjoying some cannabis before a, a bike ride is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things. Uh, that, that'll that put me in a good mood no matter where I'm at. So it helps a lot of people with a lot of things. So I can't, I can only say that it depends on, on the person, but it's definitely helpful for mental health conditions, physical health conditions. And um, so my, my favorite method of consumption is the water pipe or bong because A, uh, there is the aesthetic, uh, there is an aesthetic appeal. And B, because I can't, use, um, I can only use one hand, it's actually the easiest as well as water filtration and ice making it smoother and cooler. I, I am a, I'm a little bit of a snob for that stuff. If, you were if we're talking about someone who is undiagnosed, I would say definitely seek professional help and get a diagnosis to, to know where you're at. They are diagnosed and they are just kind of at a loss for what to do. I know this, this quarantine has uh, been uh, tough on me. I have a lot of uh, coping skills that are reliant on infrastructure that has been cut off from me because of this and that's been really hard. So I have just, anything you can do to keep your spirits up, whether, you know, if that's exercising or cannabis, is just, eh, I try to be smiling more often than not. They, they, that's really, it's also something that's helped me tremendously in my, in my fight with depression, is understanding that if I'm smiling, I'm not as sad as I might think I am. So I like to, I try to catch myself smiling and to, to remind myself that, okay, I'm not as doom and gloom as I might feel. I can walk the line of excessive use for sure, but on the whole, I do think it helps me stay balanced because I have, I'm on the autism spectrum, the Asperger's or high functioning autism, um, and I have anxiety. My brain, uh, to quote uh, Elon Musk, he said it's like a nonstop explosion of ideas. And I've identified with that a lot, that that's how it feels where it's constantly all like, I can't get a moment's rest in my, in my mind. And cannabis allows me not to stop that flow of nonstop ideas, but slow it down and, and redirect it easier than I can unmedicated. On the autism, cannabis has proven to me to be a great uh, kind of social lubricant. Before, uh, I was regularly medicated or medicating. Uh, social situations were very difficult for me because of my uh, impaired ability to understand body language and social cues. But I found that the, the mellow state that comes from cannabis puts me in a state where I'm able to talk to new people and be a little more extroverted and not as shy. So that's another, I guess, another area where it helps me with my mental health. My name is Ethan Hebbard. I am from Long Beach, California, and I am a 25-year-old suicide attempt survivor living with 
anxiety and depression as well as being on the autism spectrum. I had a stroke as a result of my suicide attempt, which caused a traumatic brain injury. And I spend my time advocating for mental health and suicide prevention and going to class studying philosophy. And when I'm not doing that, I like to smoke some weed. My, my Instagram is rl underscore skybox. That's sky, like the blue thing, and box, like the square thing. Um, it's a picture of a cat smoking a cigarette, I'm pretty sure. And that's really my social media presence. Thank you for checking out Behind the Leaf. Hey everybody, my name is Jerry. I'm the co-founder of CanAid. We're a uh, cannabis manufacturing and distribution facility located here in Long Beach, California. I'm here today to introduce our first line of products, which is a uh, THC infused syrup. The cool thing about these products are the multiple ways that you can use it. Get really creative with your medication. And today I'm gonna to show you some of those different ways. We're gonna make some yogurt that you can enjoy for breakfast or after dinner dessert. We're gonna make some energy drinks. So follow me to the fridge and let's get to mixing. So here we got some yogurt uh, that we're gonna infuse with our uh, Medibal mixer. And then uh, I got some energy drinks, Monster, and then my favorite Perrier, so let's get to mixing. Next, I'm gonna make some Monster energy drinks. So for the Monster, we're gonna use two different flavors, okay? We're gonna go with apple, which uh, green apple, and then we're gonna do uh, Concord grape as well. Pour in some Monster. Uh, this is Concord grape, really delicious. Do you know when we are going to uh, a lot of the dispensaries, when we're introducing the product, one of the first things they were saying is like, oh, is this like that purple stuff? And I was like, oh, not really. <laughs> this is a cannabis infused syrup. Uh, there was a different vision or view to it, but that just sort of got stuck. So we are like, you know what? It's only right to create a purple color <laughs> syrup. So that's how this started, but it turned out delicious and it's one of my favorites. So it's in my top three for sure. There you go, that's the grape. And then on this one, we're gonna do green apple because Monster is sour. I'm gonna add some sour green apple to it. One of our managers, um, Steve, his, that's his favorite. Green apples is favorite. He loves the color, he loves the look, he loves the whole shebang. So over here we have a uh, green apple infused Monster Energy drink. And on this left hand I have a Concord grape infused Monster Energy drink. So cheers. Perfect time to drink these. Probably in the morning to get your day started. <laughs> some energy, some medication, get your day started the right way, and uh, hopefully you have a good one. <laughs> so over here I got some Chobani Greek uh, yogurt, peach cobbler. Uh, I got some granola on the uh, right side of it. What we're gonna do here is infuse this baby here with some Canade, again, the entire bottle is 100 milligrams. However, we have micro dosing option on the side of the bottle so you can control your level of medication, especially if you're enjoying this in the morning for breakfast, unless it's Saturday or Sunday, then you can go crazy. Child resistant bottle, also sealed. It's sealed really well. So I'm gonna do about like 20 milligrams. Pour this puppy in there a little bit. That's about 10 and that's the other 10 and then Flip the granola in like this, yeah. And then get to mixing. And then you have a double peach cobbler breakfast of champions here with granola. You have a double peach cobbler breakfast of champions. Delicious, <laughs> delicioso. So like I mentioned, we're, uh, our facility is located in Long Beach, California. This is our home. We have other small businesses here in Long Beach. Uh, we love the city. We love the community. We love everything about it, honestly. So if there are any ways that we can help 
with uh, in terms of making our product better for the dispensaries in Long Beach or for our patients in Long Beach, please reach out. You can find our email address uh, on our website, on our Instagram page. We'd love to hear feedback. We'd love to better ourselves, better our product. And honestly, that's what we're doing this for. So reach out to us. Let us know what you think. Let us know how we can make it better and we'll get to working. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of At The Root Of It, where cannabis meets policy. Today, we have a very special guest that I'm very happy to bring on. We have Mr. Uduak Joe Intuk, who is the Vice President of the Long Beach College Board. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have been a longtime ally of the LBCA and a longtime friend. Please tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you got here. Hey, uh, Stephen. Great to be with you. I'm Uduak Joe Intuk. I'm a uh... Long Beach City College Board of Trustees elected to represent North Long Beach. That includes Bixby Knowles, North Long Beach, uh, kind of north of the 405 freeway. Uh, and I'm one of five uh, trustees citywide elected to oversee the college. Which Long Beach City College, people may not know, has about a $1.2 billion budget overall. That's public money for transfers, for graduation, for job training, for construction. We're building a new pool right now that will be ready for the Olympics. Uh, on campus. So we're doing a lot of great things for the community at Long Beach City College. Uh, but I, um, I'm, that's my alma mater. That's where I got started. So I went to Long Beach City College in the late 90s. I played football. I was part of the Viking football team. We won a conference championship 1998. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I got my ring still. <laughs> my, my championship ring. But when I was at Long Beach City College, I was a team parent. I had a kid, I was married at 19, uh, trying to, you know, make a life for myself. I thought I was gonna go to the NFL and play in the league. Uh, it didn't work out, but I did transfer. I played NCAA Division II football in Texas, uh, you know, and got to, got to change my dream. But ultimately I got my AA degree and I went and I transferred to Long Beach State and I finished my degree in chemical engineering. So I did a bachelor's in chemical engineering, minor in business. I went to study abroad in China to learn about international business. Uh, great opportunity to Long Beach State. Uh, and then I went to go work. And I worked in the uh, oil fields in Bakersfield for about six years. But I also did my master's at USC in petroleum engineering at the time. So, you know, I'm, I'm always um, hustling, you know. And along the way, you know, I, you know, cannabis has been with us a long time before we became legal for recreational and medical. And it's, uh, you know, unfortunately has uh, negatively impacted black and brown communities with this war, this failed war on drugs, uh, you know, lock them up, ask questions later, mandatory minimums for small drug offenses. It's horrible. It's ruined people's lives, millions of people's lives, broken up families. It wasn't the right thing to do. And we know that today. And actually for me personally, I have a little brother. There's a, he, he's just like Uduak Joe, except he got caught up in the system. He's uh, you know minor drug offenses, been in and out of prison the last 20 years, never able to finish college, uh, struggled with work. You know, you get a, a, you get a conviction, you always got to put it on the application. You know, you, now you're not eligible for FAFSA for financial aid at college. You want to come to Long Beach City College, you got a drug conviction? We don't have FAFSA for you because the federal government said it's no, you're disqualified. And we're actually fighting to change that in Washington, D.C. But it's a, it's a personal issue for me. But also, you think about the local economy, it's not every day you got a whole new industry pop up that has good paying jobs, health care, retirement, and you don't need to fly somewhere. I just need to drive down the street, you know, to North Long Beach, to West Long Beach, downtown Long Beach. Okay. Man, what an opportunity, what an economic opportunity for the city, for the residents, the, the sales tax, that goes pays for our potholes and the tree trimming, all, you know, some of that comes to the college, help pay for classes and teachers. It's a win-win. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about uh, uh, what's happening and, and, and uh, I've had a long journey to get here and, and I'm actually the first African-American male, man, ever left the college board. And there's only been two uh, uh, African-Americans ever elected to the college board. There was Pat Laughlin back in the 90s and then myself. Actually, Pat 
signed my AA degree. I got the Pat Laughlin stamp on there. Oh, wow, <laughs> nice. I was board president back in the day when I was a student back in 1999 when I graduated. You're, you're rooted in Long Beach City College through and through. Um, tell, tell everyone a little bit about the effort or the partnership that you saw, the need for cannabis workforce development. Sure, you know, um, I'm at, and you say about Long Beach City College through and through, I'm actually a third generation uh, in my family go to Long Beach City College. My grandfather was a flag deck captain in World War II in the Navy, and when they used to have a naval base. But when he got done with the Navy, he had a GI Bill, he came to Long Beach City College, and he got trained to become a machinist, and he worked for McDonnell Douglas for almost 30 years, good paying job, you know, healthcare benefits, retirement, he could buy a home, you know, that provided stability uh, for, for my mom and our family, even, we still own the house that he bought back in the 1940s today, up, up in North Long Beach, you know, and, and then my parents went to Long Beach City College for job training, because the economy changed. My mom got a, a, a AA in graphic design. My dad got a electronics certificate back in the day, right? And now the economy has shifted again. Lo and behold, cannabis is here. Why not create that same type of training opportunity for the next generation of students? Because, you know, it's our kids, our grandkids, our students. But Long Beach City College, we're the equity epicenter of the city. You don't need an SAT. You don't even need a high school diploma. If you're formerly incarcerated, you get automatically admitted to Long Beach City College. And our, our classes are so affordable, it's $47 a unit. You know, uh, even if you don't get financial aid, you can afford $150 for a class, you know, and that's a transferable class. But now with cannabis training, this is new and innovative, right? So we're partnering with Long Beach uh, Collective Association to offer industry training uh, for anybody who's interested in learning about the industry. And it's a full spectrum logistics, inventory, marketing, customer service. You know, you got edibles and infusion and gummy bears, you name it, right? We have we have a culinary arts program at Long Beach City College. We already have a business training program. We already have a logistics program. Man, those are the skills needed in this new industry that didn't exist 10 years ago. You know, because now it's recreational and medical. We have healthcare, we have nurses. We have a nursing program at Long Beach City College. You know, you need some advice on what kind of uh, symptoms and, you know, if we can train people to get a, your nursing degree and that certificate in cannabis, man, people can be a custom nursing advisory for healthcare and cannabis. Man, I want that job. This is a new day. It's a new game. <laughs> and, and it's Corona-proof job, right? You can do that from <laughs> home in the pandemic. Pandemic-proof business model. Is yeah, it so that's how we, you know, we've, we've been working hard behind the scenes for... So I just I campaigned on this when I ran for office, and and I and, and I and I've been working with our vice president, uh, Dr. Kathy Scott. We've been working with our economic development, Melissa Infusio. Been great job with the staff of Long Beach City College. But I can tell when I was campaigning on this, and I would tell people I want to do a cannabis workforce training, they would jump out the door, literally jump out the door. But like, man, I voted for you, <laughs> and I was like, great. Great. <laughs> go, go vote on election day, you know, and, and I and they, I don't want to just say it for the sake of saying it. We got to make it real, you know, because if we're not really changing people's lives, give them a real certificate, give them real training that the industry needs, the people, you know, people been in the, you know, I got 20 years experience in Canada. Well, that's when it was the uh, illicit market. <laughs> now you need- When there's no rules. <laughs> there's no rules. Now there's rules. You got everybody regulated. The city has a rule, the state has a rule, the county. LA City has rules different from Signal Hill. Signal Hill don't have no rules, mm -hmm. you know? And so everybody needs to know what the rules are so you can be complied, so you can have business. And that business should be about growing the pie and giving more people opportunities that didn't happen. So all these people who are negatively impacted in the past, this is the social equity policy that seems to talk about. So let's, let's restore the harm by giving people good jobs. And at Long Beach City College, we're doing expungement workshops. We're helping people clean up their record. Like, man, you know, it's a reset. Yeah, and that's extremely, that's extremely important. I didn't even know about the expungement clinic, especially with expungement week happening literally next week. That's, that's kind of amazing to find oh, out. Oh, oh, did I? You didn't tell me that. We didn't know about that ahead of time. <laughs> you you mentioned when you were campaigning, you wanted people to go and vote, to get out there and, you know, actually voice that. Why is it important for people to get involved with local elections or even to vote for college board? 
Yeah, you know, a lot of people think uh, the only thing that matters is the president and the Supreme Court, and that's really important. But local elections are the most important election in your day-to-day -day life. You know, at, at the Long Beach City College Board, we don't do international treaties. We don't decide nuclear war. We don't set tax policy for your, you know, IRS. We don't do that. But what we do do is make sure you can graduate and transfer. Uh, make, we do have a bond measure where people who are property owners pay a small fee every year to help pay for new buildings and facilities at the college. You know, so it's uh, it's interconnected. But then even that, that's college, what about city? Right, the city oversees the police department, the fire department, tree trimming, the port, the airport, right? All those things are important to our community. And if you don't vote, you don't have a voice in who's gonna be there. We're still in a functional democracy, and democracy means everybody has to go put your stamp. Where do you believe? Who do you support? Do they share your values or not? Will they vote for the things you want them to vote for? I mean, I remember when President Obama got elected, I was like, man, finally someone's voting like the way I want it. I would vote if, you know, if I was president, you know, that, he's doing it, you know? And we should be having Obamas on the city council and Obamas on the school board and Obamas at the college board. And so there's individual people that really matter and you just need a simple majority even at the board, right? So representative democracy, you, re you vote for representatives, but it's all a simple majority. We got five people on the college board. You need three votes, that makes a majority. Three people, you do the same thing. Five people on the school board, you need three votes. City council is nine people. You get five votes, you get a lot of things done. So if everybody votes, right? And it doesn't matter where you live, Central Long Beach, East Long Beach, North Long Beach, you just vote for whoever you want. Nobody's gonna tell you how to vote and that's the power of the American Constitution. The American Constitution still is in effect. Even though people are saying, oh, we're in the days and all this. Yeah, law and order is the Constitution of the United States of America. And there's a Constitution of California. And that those are our constitutions that everyday people. You, whether you're a citizen or non-citizen, that's the governance of America, of our community. It's a constitution. And then people who get elected, they have to uphold the constitution. Fairness, equality, due process, right? Those, it all happens at the local level, all the way up to Congress and state assembly and president. But, you know, a lot of people just vote for president and don't vote for nothing else. But we matter too. Vote for the lower, lower, all the way down the ballot, please. When we look towards the future, we have this workforce development happening with our city college. We have the actual city of Long Beach working in hand in hand with the operators. What do you see the future of cannabis looking like? Well, um, man, that's a great question, Stephen. Now you can see my background. I'm here at Long Beach City College in our uh, modern classrooms. We want to make this space available for the community. We want to make this space available for our local small businesses. That if you want to get, uh, if you're a cannabis uh, entrepreneur, right? We want to help you do your business plan. We want to help you make sure you have a marketing plan. We operate the Small Business Development Center for the region at Long Beach City College. So anybody who's new businesses that are starting out, we can help train you for either free or low cost. The little to no money, you can get business training professional to get legit. We can do that at Long Beach City College. Then we all have the Goldman Sachs Small Business Program, 10,000 small business. We can help you grow your business, right? They'll come and do consulting and say, okay, if you did this, this, and this, you can quadruple your cash flow. You can hire 10 more employees. And man, we want you to hire Long Beach City College students. And we want you to hire Long Beach City College, or Long Beach residents, right? That's, that's the goal, to grow these businesses to have more opportunity for our, our residents in Long Beach. And that means more tax revenue. That means people are buying more homes. I mean, the streets get clean. We got money for trim the trees. We got money for classes at City College. All, it's all interconnected, right? But the other thing is, we are partnering, and, and you may have already, you know, folks may not know, our cannabis class that we started, 25 spots, we are through the roof with people signing up. Over 800 people have signed up, right? We have, there is demand. There is pent up demand that people want this education and we're gonna do it. And now we gotta figure out how do we scale it so we can do more classes and we're in the middle of a global pandemic. So we can do it all online. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a win-win, you know, but we need to figure out what's the right cost, how to get the people signed up, making sure you get a certificate at the end, you're getting the skills the business needs, but also it pays for itself. And that's a partnership opportunity with the city. The city talks about a social equity policy, 
I'd like to see them put some budget money behind it. I'd like to see them partner officially with Long Beach City College, not just talk about it, but be about it. So I'm gonna challenge my friends at the city, city manager's office, equity office, city council. Don't tell me, show me. Come partner with Long Beach City College. Let's get those 800 people trained so that we have a stronger workforce in Long Beach and we may have a stronger Long Beach, you know? And it's, uh, this is a kind of partnership innovation that we need to do together. And especially when we're trying to survive a global pandemic, we can do it if we partner together. And I know that the LBCA is 100% on board with that partnership and supporting everything that goes forward, especially when it comes to social equity. We are working very closely with that equity office right now. So we thank you for all of your work and, and that challenge. Uduak, is there anything that you would like to leave the people with before we kind of wrap up at the root of it? Yeah, no, Stephen, I just want to thank you. Thank the LBCA for having me on today for your partnership and doing policy and small business creation. You know, this is what a new Long Beach is all about. This is what, uh, when we have real partnership, that we don't get caught up in the politics. We're really about solving people's problems, helping put food on the table, a roof over people's head, that we're giving a real opportunity. And, and man, we've turned the corner. You know, cannabis is a legitimate industry that has real opportunity and we can't let that slip through our fingers. So uh, I want to let you know, I'm just committed to continue to work together. I think we can do even better things than what we've done. Uh, and I know that the, the, our, my neighbors and residents and kids and students are all interested in this. So let's give them what they want and let's work, uh, work on that together. So last thing I was going to say, I know it's an incredibly difficult time in the pandemic, uh, a lot of pain and suffering, economic and personal and healthcare. And just, we got to you know, look out for one another. We got to take a deep breath when we're driving down the street and not honk the horn, man. I know a lot of people are stressed out. I feel it, you know, and it's, um, but we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Viruses have been around our whole human existence and we will beat them before and we will beat them again. And there'll be a day when coronavirus is over and we're going to be stronger afterwards and we're going to have new partnerships. And I hope Everyone thinks about how can we redefine our local economy, our local education system when the pandemic's over, that we're in a better place together. If anyone wants to get a hold of you or get to know you a little bit more, where can they find you? Where can they reach out to you? Well, I do have a website, uduakjoe.com. I know it's just my name, U-D-U-A-K-J-O-E.com. You can contact me there. You can do a meeting request. Uh, we provide information. I have scholarships on my website. Um, have the easiest way to connect me. You can also find me on social media, Twitter, on uh, Facebook and so forth. So uh, I'm, I'm available and look forward to continue to work together. As for me, you can find everything cannabis and LBCA related at the LBCA.com. And if you want to get more information about that cannabis education class going on, make sure you head over to Long Beach City College website. Thank you so much for joining us at the root of it. I'm feeling good. <laughs> Did you know that in 1951, Congress passed the Boggs Act, which created a mandatory minimum sentence for first-time drug offenders? Well, I'm Stephanie, and from the LBCA media team, and I'm going to tell you all about it, and this is High History! In 1951, Congress passed the Boggs Act, which would establish mandatory minimums for first-time drug offenders. The act was named after Hell Boggs, the Louisiana House Representative. The act would severely lengthen the average sentence by several folds. The Boggs Act also made no distinction between consumers and traffickers. This was the first time that cannabis was lumped in with narcotics. It was treated as harshly as heroin. So this would be a rebellious act and I would probably be punished for just smoking this uh, joint. The punishment was so severe that it would require a mandatory minimum of two years for the first offense. There was a sentence of five to 10 years for the second offense and 10 to 20 years for the third offender. It makes me feel extremely sad and I and empathic for all of the people that were punished for something that I do every single day. It also makes me feel 
filled with gratitude that I have to put into action towards cannabis activism so I can make sure that no one else is gonna be punished for this. In 2014, I was hitchhiking and I had a, just trimmed a little bit of pot. So then I had my little stash and had a little bit of keef and I was pulled over. I didn't really think anything of it because I had a little bit, but I was about to face four year sentence and a very expensive fine just because at that time, having keef was considered a concentrate and it was a felony. So I was a felon for just smoking a plant, and that I just don't understand. Well, 1951, we think that it was such a different time, but that time still affects us today. The Boggs Act propelled the mass incarcerations of black and brown people and solidified the stigma of cannabis use that we still have to this day in 2020. That's unbelievable. So the Boggs Act was the act of 1951, which would establish mandatory minimum for first time drug offenders. This was the first time that cannabis was lumped into narcotics and it was treated as harshly as heroin. The sentences for first time offenders were from two to five years, five to 10 years for second time offenders and third time offenders would receive 10 to 20 years just for smoking a little bit of cannabis. The government liked mandatory minimums so much that in 1956, they followed up with another act, the Narcotics Act, that bumped up the mandatory minimum to five years for first-time offenders and 10 years for, for second-time offenders. That was the Boggs Act of 1951, and I hope that now you understand what the importance of cannabis policy and reform. My name is Stephanie, and I'm part of the LBCA team, and this is High History. Whoa, I'm on the cell phone. You got issues. You need cannabis, friend. Yeah, it's a green plant that helps your body, mind, and soul. Try it out. Yeah.